Hey everybody, I'm Daquan Johnson. I'm an MD-PhD student and today's video is long overdue. Um, I was asked a while ago about how do you decide on what is the best MD-PhD program for you? And I'm gonna break this video up more so into two parts where we're thinking about how do you apply to the proper programs as well as how do you choose the best program if you're given the opportunity to have multiple choices in the end? So let's start with first breaking down the difference between an MSTP and just an MD PhD program. So let me share my screen and we're on the NIH website. MSTP or Medical Scientist Training Program is a specific program funded by the NIH, the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences, using the pre-doctoral training grant mechanism or T32 grant. And what that means is that the NIH goes through all of their criteria and they have programs in medical schools and graduate schools apply to this grant process and get validated for their ability to train in an integrated manner their medical and research professionals. And so there are only 50 of these programs in the US that are training about a thousand students. So that tells you already that they're quite selective. It's very small, very competitive. But one of the upsides of these programs is that if a program has the title of a medical scientist training program, then we know that it has the NIH's quality approval badge. That means they believe that this program is top notch and deserving of NIH dollars to make sure they're training qualified physician scientists. So that means if you go to any MSTP program in the country, you're pretty much getting a very similar education that will be outmatched by most other programs. And you get some other benefits as well. You get the added benefit of having protected funding, as well as having tuition remission for both medical school and graduate school, which is not the case for most MD, PhD programs that are not MSTP programs. And so I'll give you a list of the 50 programs in the comments below, but let's just take a quick peek. And so we can see that about 25 states have these MSTP programs. Not every state is represented, so that means there are multiple states that have more than one program. And we see that there's quite a few schools here. Um, and there's about 50 of them. And like I said, so not every single MD-PhD program is an MSTP. And here's an example of an MD-PhD program that is not an MSTP. We're looking at Georgetown University, which is a great medical school. They also have an MD-PhD program. However, they're not an MSTP. And when we look at their financial aid support, their students only get 50% off of their tuition and fees for medical school for their first two years of medical school. They do, however, receive to a full tuition remission for their graduate school, as well as a competitive stipend for their, for their graduate school years. But we don't really know what happens for the third and fourth year from their website. But needless to say, you're paying for half of the tuition for your first two years of medical school, which is kind of a drawback compared to the MSTP program where you get full remission at places like Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, University of Virginia, University of Minnesota. But that's not to say that all MD-PhD programs that are not MSTP funded are the same. So I pulled up the booklet for the University of Nebraska Medical Center, which is also not an MSTP. But when we look at their financial support summary, they do give full tuition remission and fees for their MD-PhD students for both medical school and graduate school, in addition to giving them their stipend at the level of the NIH programs. And while this is not an MSTP, for students that are in Nebraska, which do not have MSTP programs, this could be a great alternative. Geography is very important for you to stay close to home and have a very competitive MD-PhD education. So that's one of the things I wanna show you. So the first thing you need to decide as an applicant and trying to decide which programs are good for you are, am I going to apply only to MSTP programs, or am I gonna open my umbrella and open my vision to more MD, PhD programs that may not have the NIH stamp of approval, but are working on it? 
Me personally, I applied solely to MSTP programs just because I like the extra security that no matter what happens, I was guaranteed my funding. I was guaranteed that I would have everything taken care of throughout my entire training. That was my goal. And that's what I applied for. The second thing you want to make sure now is that if you're deciding between MSDP and MD-PhD programs are do your scores match up? Because you don't want to be applying to a lot of programs that you have no shot in getting into. I've already shown you that for MSTP programs, there are only 50 of them in the country and they're only servicing about a thousand students compared to the vast number of graduate students and medical students in the United States. So let's take an example. We can look at Johns Hopkins MD-PhD program and look at their incoming class from 2019. They had an average GPA of 3.91 with a range from 3.6 to 4.0. Given the high GPA, we know in the low student count for each year, class would be about 17 students. We know that the majority of the students were on this high end. Most of them probably higher than a 3.85, maybe a 3.9, mostly 4.0s. So it means you're not hitting those scores most likely you're not even be considered for an interview. And likewise, look at these really high MCAT scores. The average is about a 522, with the lowest score being a 514. And just to give you an idea of what that score is, a 522 is a 99th percentile, with the lowest score being a 90th percentile. So they're already showing you by their statistics that they're favoring students with these high scores. So if Hopkins, Yale, Harvard, these schools are being your top choices. These are the schools that you're considering. You have to make sure that your scores match. If they do not, I don't suggest applying to too many of them. It's great to apply to maybe one or two of these REACH schools just to see what happens. However, I would not invest too much time into applying to too many of these programs because you'll be wasting time that you'll be putting into crafting a great secondary application to programs that you're definitely qualified for and making sure you can make your case and improve your chances of getting to those programs. So we can look at another MD-PhD program, uh, the one that I actually attend, and we can see that in the last cycle of students that were accepted, the GPA was a little bit lower, 3.75, um, MCAT at a 515 average, and we also focus a little bit more also on the research side too. Almost every one of our students that came in had over 4,500 hours worth of research, a very extensive research history. And so if we look at this again, 515 is about the 92nd percentile for the, for the average. So that's it's pretty good, but you can see the difference between the 515 and the 522. And this is also, this is a MCAT score percentile sheet from the AMC and how the percentiles break down. This is what we're referencing right now. I can also put this link in my comments below. So as you can see, you have to make sure that your scores and your standings stack up. And they will vary from school to school. So make sure you can find these values uh, on the website. And some of them are harder to find. So I will just take some time, scroll through all of these programs, look and see if you can find those statistics, see whether or not you stack up to them. The next thing you want to start looking at is making a list of your non-negotiables. Your non-negotiables will be different for every single person. This would be whether or not geography is important for you, whether or not you want to be close to home, close to family, or your geography is important because you're married or you have a spouse or a significant other that cannot move as much and their company only exists in a few states. And so those schools are probably going to take priority for your attention. Or maybe you have kids and you want to make sure that the public school system there is good enough to make sure your kids get a very good education while you're in your program. Or you want to make sure that you have hobbies that are very much weather dependent. You might like skiing and snowboarding. And not every state in the United States allows you to do that. So these are the list of non-negotiables that are important to you that you need to make. And see how all of those overlap with the schools you want to apply for. This will probably make your application list probably less than 15 schools. And for me, that was great because I applied realistically really to five schools very seriously. And for me, that was good because it means it gave me a lot of time to really think about and really craft versus rushing like many of my classmates who applied to 25 plus schools just to make sure they can shotgun it and hopefully get into one program. I just made sure that I did more quality over quantity. The schools that I really considered by doing the same process, considering which schools I would realistically attend and enjoy attending, 
I made sure that I crafted the best possible application to put my best foot forward. And when I interviewed, I showed that same level of effort to make sure that they knew that I was very serious about their program. I'm not just shotgunning and hoping to get in somewhere, but I really thought about how the school and me would mix very well and make sure that my commitment would stay there. And so that was the thought process for pre-interview for the application process. There's also things just to think about the fact that it costs money to apply to these programs. If you get interviews to all these programs, you have to pay for travel. You have to, if you're still a student, you'll be away from classes quite a bit. So you want to start making sure that if that's something you're willing to take on. If you're willing to go anywhere, then by all means, apply to 25 plus programs or 30 plus programs because statistically, the more programs you apply to, the more likely you are to get in. Um, however, I still think that sometimes after a certain amount of time, you're trying to return all those secondaries, it gets very difficult to make sure the quality stays consistent as you're starting to do more high volume applications. So in the post interview phase, hopefully while you're interviewing, while you're being interviewed, you were interviewing the programs as well. What do I mean by that? So it means as you're being interviewed, that you're taking inventory and you're thinking about how different encounters made you feel. This will be super important because you want to make sure that you're going to a program, going to a location where you feel respected, you feel safe, and you feel like you will enjoy it. Because eight years is a long time to be somewhere that you do not enjoy. So you want to make sure you enjoy the people, you enjoy the culture, you enjoy the nuances that are there. Because if you don't, it will make it a very tough eight years. And so what that means is that you're looking to make sure that you're trying to get the school not on their best behavior. Because of course, once you get accepted, they will have a second visit. But the second visit is the worst time to make your full decision because now the school's on their best behavior. They're pulling out all the bells and whistles. They're whining and dining you making sure they can convince you to come to their school. But you want to make sure you're seeing them both on their a little bit more offensive game compared to the defensive game. I got some really great advice from one of the previous directors, not previous, but one of the current directors of a different program, where he told me to, at the end of every interview, I create a table. I write down the name of the institution. I write down how I felt going into the interview, how I felt during the interview, and what are my thoughts afterwards. Everything I felt in terms of did I represent myself very well? Did I feel like I really meshed well with the students? Did the faculty members kind of match my interests in science? And all those different things. Making sure I culminated all of those ideas and all of those feelings that I felt. Because I'll have to make that decision months later. And so having that documented somewhere where you can have a direct comparison is super important. And I guess I'm not using my screen no more. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So finishing this up, you want to make sure you have those direct comparisons from your interviews so that now you have a more directed path as you're going into your second visits. Yes, you should enjoy that time, but you also should make sure that you have a guided path, set amount of questions that you need to have answered to make your decision a lot easier. The last thing you wanna talk about is usually your science as well. And say you're in a situation where you're not really sure what you want your science to be in the future as a career path, that is okay. Just make sure that you're picking programs that have good generalizable science. They have researchers in cancer, they have researchers in neuroscience, they have researchers in genetics. All these generalizable things that may catch your interest. And again, like I said, I've been preaching that you should not be focused on the individual project itself, you should be focused on the people and the person making sure they teach you good science, not necessarily you're working on the individual question because the process is so long for us that many times the question is not the goal. The goal is to understand how to do good science and answer any question that we may encounter in the future. So it's fine not to know which science exactly you want to do, but just make sure the program has enough variety that different questions and different projects catch your, catch your attention. And hopefully that will answer all the questions. If you need more clarification, drop a comment or drop a question down in the comment section below. Subscribe if you like the content. Hit the notification bell to know when the next video is uploaded. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.